Well, it's 5.30 on Monday night. Uh, good evening. Uh, my name is Kyle Uveling. I'm the Chief Medical Officer at St. Anthony Regional Hospital in Carroll, Iowa, and a cardiologist with the Iowa Heart Center. And I'm here tonight to host a discussion uh, for a COVID-19 update for our area, but also with a specific focus to discuss uh, the current vaccines and upcoming vaccination plan for our area. A uh, little housekeeping, we're planning on having this discussion go about an hour. So when it gets uh, closer to that uh, hour mark, I may inform all the speakers that we're gonna be kind of going through a lightning round of the remaining questions, uh, just for everybody's knowledge. Uh, a lot of the questions that we received and uh, we've received uh, nearly a hundred uh, had or variations on certain themes about timing and eligibility. Uh, so I've combined some of the variations of the questions into a single question or a couple. Uh, but for, that's one of the reasons I'm not going to be naming all of the authors of the questions. And the other reason is uh, for privacy. Some of the questions said, I am a cancer survivor or I am a dialysis patient. Just for privacy, I, I, all, all the questions are going to be kept anonymous. Uh, I'd like to introduce our panel for tonight. Uh, uh, on my screen in the top left is Dr. Mark Collison. Uh, Dr. Collison is an internist with the St. Anthony Clinic, if you wouldn't mind giving away for the audience. There he is. Uh, then Dr. John Evans. Uh, Dr. John Evans is a family medicine physician with the McFarland Clinic. Sarah Schulte, uh, she's one of our representatives from Carroll County Public Health. She's a nurse with the department. And then Nicole Schwering, is our director of Carroll County Public Health and a nurse with the department. I wanna thank everybody for uh, on the panel for joining us tonight. Uh, I know everybody's incredibly busy, but I know uh, based on our last town hall and based on the questions sent in for tonight, uh, you guys are really providing a, a big community service by doing this tonight. So thank you very much for taking the time and, mm -hmm. and going through the questions. Uh, just some updates on uh, COVID-19 in our area. Uh, as of today, our current active cases are 256 for Carroll County. To give some perspective, at the beginning of December, we were over 600. So we have seen a marked improvement in our total case count, in our positivity rate. Uh, we're now down to 13.5%, what that number is reflective of, is in the last two weeks, all of the tests that have been done for COVID-19, how many of those tests are positive? So. 13.5% is also a marked improvement compared to November and December. Uh, so a big thank you to our community, to our region, to our healthcare providers that are helping with education and treatment. Uh, but for Dr. Evans, Dr. Collison that have provided a lot of inpatient care at St. Anthony, uh, it's a lot nicer to have those numbers go down, correct? For sure. Uh, so we'll get uh, into the vaccine discussion. Uh, uh, we'll start with the background. So Dr. Collison, I'm going to put you up on deck first. Uh, would you mind going through uh, the two different vaccines that have been approved for use in the United States and kind of give us uh, uh, what should the, uh, the public expect when they get a call saying that they're eligible to, to register? Well, there are two vaccines that are approved. One is Moderna and the other one is a Pfizer product. The Moderna one doesn't require the real frigid temperatures like the Pfizer one does. Uh, they both require two shots. Um, one is four weeks apart and one is three weeks apart. The success, the efficacy, the um, effectiveness of these are pretty similar, um, 95 to 99% effective, both of them. And one thing that I think is really important is they've had no hospitalizations with people that have been immunized. So those few people that did um, come down with the disease did not have a serious form of the disease. Thank you. Uh, the, the super chilled function of the Pfizer uh, the, b before it's ready to be uh, given to people, for that reason, uh, Sarah and Nicole, uh, we've seen a lot more of the Moderna for the uh, healthcare workers uh, in our area, is that is that right? That's correct. Uh, I believe there's five centers in the state that are the thawing sites where the super chilled Pfizer vaccine comes and then they thaw it out. And that's why kind of the, the areas around Polk County, around Johnson County, where some of those thawing centers are, that's why the Pfizer's kind of went to their area and Moderna's <clears throat> went to us. Would that be accurate? Yep, I would agree with that. 
the bigger cities have the the means to store the Pfizer where we don't have the the ultra cold cold storage for them. And uh, Dr. Collis mentioned it, but I mean the the super cooled. So if we think of 32 degrees Fahrenheit as freezing, the Pfizer has got to be kept around negative 100 Fahrenheit. I mean that that's far colder than what any of our normal equipment in the hospital could provide. Uh, Dr. Evans, would you mind going through some of the background as far as how do we get to approved vaccines and what does it mean that we have uh, that, that, that the two were approved in 2020? Sure. And I also think it'd be helpful to answer some of the questions we hear a lot in terms of, is it safe? And wasn't this thing rushed too fast? You know, can we trust it? So um, the technology that both Pfizer and Moderna used is the messenger RNA uh, way of developing the vaccine. And this is not a new technology. They've been uh, developing different companies and researchers have been developing this messenger RNA technology for over 20 years. They've used it on a number of other vaccines and have really perfected uh, a way to make these in a uh, reliable, safe fashion. So the technology was good to begin with and it was ready to go when this came on board. Um, the, the second part of that is um, these messenger MRA uh, particles do not go into the nucleus. They do not affect the DNA. They cannot change your genome. They cannot change who you are. Um, they also do not contain the virus. So you cannot get, you don't get the virus from the vaccine. You can have side effects from the vaccine, but you cannot get the virus from the vaccine. The other part about the speed of this, usually a vaccine takes several years to develop. This was done in record time for several reasons. One, they had the technology with the mRNA ready to go. And then secondly, the uh, pharmaceutical companies were given the go ahead to start all three of the phases of the trials at once. Um, the government backed them financially so that if it didn't work out, they would recoup the, the loss. But essentially they got all three phases ready to go. Once uh, the vaccine was approved and phase one was complete, they started right in on phase two. They didn't have to develop phase two or do the research or get the money together to do that. They were ready to go. Same thing after phase two, they went right into phase three. Thankfully, both of these vaccines were successful in all three phases. They met all of the FDA and uh, Institutes of Health safety guidelines for all three phases. So they have as much safety profile as any vaccine we've ever had. And they probably have more volunteers than almost any other vaccine we've had, which is a great tribute to all the people that volunteered. So is it effective? Yes. Is it safe? Is any vaccine? Yes. And was it rushed? Yes, but it was rushed in a safe way so that uh, we had it, so it came to market faster than any other modern vaccine. And with the, the, the subjects, the volunteers, uh, I saw something in the news where uh, a, a public health agency in another state uh, said that they were not gonna administer them because they only had 45 people in the trial. There were tens of thousands in both trials. Uh, mm -hmm. Many of them in Iowa, some of them Carroll County residents that volunteered to be part. Um, I can tell you, I had a family member in Iowa that volunteered to be part of the Pfizer trial, uh, that this is, this was a big deal. This, this was patriotic on part of the people, but this is also why they, when, if the five of us were going to try to create a new drug, we didn't typically have to go and we'd have to recruit. We have to set up centers and shopping malls to try to recruit people into trials. We did not have to do that for these vaccines, right? Correct. Right, because yeah, the people were ready to go and very anxious to get it. So that is a big time saver for sure. Uh, on the um, uh, the genome thing, uh, Dr. Evans, I wanted to just hit one more thing. So when you say that the vaccine cannot change your genome, because this is something that's been thrown out in the media as well, an mRNA vaccine will not change your DNA. No, the messenger RNA is literally just that, a messenger. It gets into the cell, the cell takes off, takes, opens it up and releases the protein. It does not go into the nucleus. It cannot affect your DNA. Uh, then that, that protein is released into the, the, the cell and the cell starts to make antibodies to it. Um, so it's, it's not a genome changing, DNA changing virus. Wonderful. Uh, Nicole, uh, can I ask you a question about uh, uh, some of the rollout thus far, which is if you could describe how, what would, when we say phase 1A, uh, one, where do we get that from? And 
Uh, what, is it, what does it exactly mean that we're in phase 1A of the vaccine rollout right now? Sure, thanks. So right now, um, currently IDPH is kind of directing the phases. You hear a lot of the phases and yes, we're in phase 1A currently, which includes um, healthcare workers, the frontline workers. Um, and that also includes the congregate settings as well as like nursing homes and the staff that work there as well. Um, so for Carroll County, as we talked earlier, we received the Moderna vaccine um, for our county for the phase 1A. So the week of Christmas, we received about 800 doses and we had those used up by New Year's Day. So that was really good. Everyone was in line and ready to get their vaccine. So that was great. Um, and then in December, we did receive another 100 vaccine um, and we used those right away. Um, so we're continuing through phase 1A. We have heard that hopefully early February, we'll move to phase 1B. Um, and we'll kind of go over what that entails in a little bit. Um, you know, we were hoping to move a little bit faster, but the, the supply of the vaccine has been limited um, everywhere. But, you know, we did see that in Iowa too, where we're limited with the vaccine. Um, and then we talked about the Pfizer. So the congregate settings, the nursing homes, assisted livings, they did receive Pfizer. Um, they all signed up through the national pharmacy ch chain. And we were hoping to get those started um, the week after Christmas as well. But of course, there's always hiccups. So they did start um, in larger areas, but in our county, they started last week administering those doses for our long-term cares. So I think most of everyone in the long-term cares have gotten their first dose now. So that's exciting as well. Yeah, that's fantastic. So I wanna go over a couple of things. Uh, what does IDPH stand for? The Iowa Department of Public Health. So that's the state organization that's been organizing the vaccines for the counties. Correct. Yep. All right. And they're the ones who uh, direct us uh, on the county and local level as far as you are now in phase 1A. You can now move on to phase 1B, et cetera. Yep. Yep. They have the vaccine shortage order out. So we have to follow their recommendations. Um, so as soon as they say that we can move to phase 1B, as soon as they um, amend that shortage order, we are ready and hopefully we have enough vaccine to do that. And the, the Pfizer portion of phase 1A, you mentioned how that's gone through the national pharmacies, mainly Walgreens and CVS, and especially locally, a lot of it has been Walgreens. That doesn't necessarily mean our friends and neighbors that work at the local Walgreens. Right, no, nope. yep, I, I do believe they hired people to come in and do those and help with those vaccine clinics. Um, I, knew, I do know that some are local, but they've hired other people to help us out to get those accomplished. And that didn't really go through the county public health agency. That was handled completely separately, kind of directly through the national pharmacy chain. Yep, yep. The federal level is allocating those doses um, instead of the state allocating to public health. So uh, we, we know because we've talked about it for weeks, but uh, the local facilities, the nursing homes in Carroll County, uh, they had signed up, they were ready for it. The uh, local nursing staff and uh, but we were already, it was just a matter of getting doses into the county, right? Correct, yep, yep. Uh, Sarah, would you uh, mind commenting just because a lot of the questions came about, we see maybe neighboring states doing something different, you know, maybe moving ahead faster than others. Uh, can you kind of explain on how in Iowa, um, the, the Iowa Department of Public Health kind of sets the course for when we all get to move on in, within our state? Correct, so thanks for the question. Um, pretty much IDPH, they are the ones that tell us what phase we're in and when we get to move to next phase. Now, when we look at maybe our neighboring state, Nebraska, um, we see that they might be doing 65 and older uh, population in the next phase or even right now. But each state can actually um, go off of what, what they want to follow. So Iowa, we follow the CDC guidance. Um, that's currently what we are following right now. Um, and Nebraska and other states that you see that are maybe going into phase 1B, 1C at this time, they have made up their own internal guidance that they're following. Um, and that's why it looks like we're, we're kind of lagging behind, but really we aren't lagging behind um, of where we're supposed to be at at this point. So based on the criteria that Iowa Department of Public Health wants the entire state to be at, 
we're there as far as Carroll County. We, we've had a, the majority of our phase 1A healthcare providers uh, on the vaccine list. In other words, if the state would give us the go-ahead to go to 1B and the vaccine doses to go to 1B, we, we're ready to go when they allow us to. Absolutely. We've gotten through most of our 1A. Um, we're just waiting for that go-ahead from the state, which uh, Nikki mentioned would be around the 1st of February. All right. Uh, Dr. Evans, can I ask you a question about the ages? So one of the questions were, uh, is the vaccine safe for teenagers? So uh, what, what answers do you have? So um, it was uh, studied down to 16 in one of the vaccine trials and down to 18 in the other. Um, that doesn't mean that those groups are not important. It just uh, usually starts with adults and then kids and uh, pregnant ma women maybe be uh, tested later. So I think there's ongoing trials now with younger people. Uh, we should have more of that out by the time that they'll be one of the last groups to be immunized because they're the healthiest cohort that we have. So by the time they're ready to be immunized, hopefully we'll have more data. There's no reason to think it won't be safe in the younger people. Um, but uh, right now that the data is not there. Um, but uh, again, our young people are the ones that do the best with the illness and they are also um, the least likely to have significant problems. So by the time the uh, spring comes around and their, their number comes up, we'll have more data to know. But at this point, it's, it's not below 16 or 18. And um, the Pfizer, I believe, is the one that goes down to 16. The yes. Moderna's cutoff is 18. Right. And we're going to talk about pregnancy in a little bit, but it, this is pretty common for all vaccine and drug trials that they typically don't always go down into the pediatric populations. Right. And if they do, it's usually a secondary trial later on after it's been proven to be safe in adults. Um, it, it's rare to do uh, trials in pregnant or breastfeeding moms. Um, a lot of times it's uh, extrapolated data and expert opinion on that. Thank you. Dr. Collison, on a similar note, uh, one of the questions were, I'm a, a transplant recipient. Uh, should I get the vaccine or should I not? And then I'll kind of segue into other, are there other specialty conditions that should uh, consider not getting it? So just on the transplant question to begin with, uh, is there any reason a transplant recipient should not? No, as a matter of fact, those are people that have immune problems that um, are at higher risk for severe disease, so they should for sure get it. And as Dr. Evans said, it's not a live virus, it's not a killed virus, it's not a virus at all, so they don't have to worry that somehow that's going to uh, take over their body. Uh, are there some patients that maybe should delay it, like if they've just been infected with uh, COVID-19, is, is there a time frame before they should get a vaccine? Well, yes, and there's some controversy about that, but um, the recommendations are you first need to be completely over your infection before you receive the vaccine. And if you were hospitalized and you have the convalescent plasma or the monoclonal antibodies, then you need to wait 90 days, three months before you receive the vaccine. And on that note, uh, Nicole and Sarah, when people go through, like we've had healthcare workers who go through the vaccination process, we ask them if they've, uh, uh, ha have they recently been contracted COVID-19 and have they received those therapies that might, we might want them to delay? Is that correct? Yes. Yeah, so anytime someone comes in for a vaccine, um, they actually go through a few stations. So they do the consent and education first. Um, and they're asked those questions there, but then when they get to us who are actually doing the vaccinations, we just reiterate and ask again, have you had COVID? Um, if so, have you had the antibodies or the plasma? Um, and if so, um, we let them know that they cannot um, get it, but, but those are on our consents and, um, you know, majority of people, they, well, they call ahead of time and, and they'll ask those questions. Wonderful. Uh, so if I go back to, uh, to this particular note though about uh, if they've had COVID-19, they as long as they've recovered, they are eligible to, to get the vaccine when their population group is called. Correct, Dr. Collison? Right, exactly. If they've gotten one of the specialized treatments like convalescent plasma inside the hospital or the monoclonal antibodies like Regeneron, Bamlanivimab as an outpatient, those patients will ask to wait 90 days, but we'll also screen for that when they 
get signed up for the vaccine. Does that sound yeah. right also? Yep. So Dr. Evans, a lot of questions came about pregnancy. So uh, what can you tell us about, uh, should pregnant women consider getting the vaccine when they're called, uh, when their population group is, is eligible? Uh, what, what, what do we know? So again, they did not enroll pregnant women or nursing mothers in the trial directly. There were, however, quite a few uh, pregnant women and nursing moms in the trial, inadvertently, if you will, and no, no negative outcome data from that. Um, I, I think it's unlikely they're going to do a large controlled trial in pregnant women. Um, so we're left with uh, understanding of how the virus works and how viruses work in pregnant women and how they protect. And so we rely on the experts who um, study these things in immunology, obstetrics, gynecology, high-risk fetal medicine. And they're all recommending that, it's, that it is safe, uh, in their opinion, for pregnant women and nursing moms to get the COVID vaccine. Um, they encourage uh, these women to speak with their physicians to be sure they're comfortable and have their questions answered. Um, I, I think it's, a, it's an individual uh, decision, but I'm encouraging all of my moms to get vaccinated. If you'd like to get out of the first trimester, I think that's uh, not uh, unreasonable, but probably not necessary. Um, you have to kind of look on the other side. If, if you got uh, the COVID infection and you had a, a significant illness, high fever, that can't, high fevers and significant illness can be associated with pregnancy complications. So avoiding that is a good thing, much like avoiding influenza during pregnancy. And um, no reason to believe that breastfeeding moms um, wouldn't be safe to get it as well. Uh, there would be some passive immunity to the infant in both of those situations, pregnancy and nursing. So that, that is considered a good thing. Um, and the, the reactions that people are getting from the vaccine are uh, typically very minimal. Um, the, the only group that I've seen that uh, should give a pause would be those that have had anaphylactic reactions to vaccines, medicines, peanuts, et cetera. Those need kind of special handling regardless of whether they're pregnant or not um, in order to get the vaccine. But all other groups, uh, strong recommendation to go ahead and get vaccinated. If you're not sure, pregnant or nursing, talk to your uh, provider and physician and they'll, they'll help you work that out. Thank you. Sarah, on that note, what Dr. Evans just mentioned about the, you know, concern over anaphylactic reactions, uh, I was thinking when we started the rollout for the healthcare workers last month, uh, can you kind of give an, uh, uh, a walkthrough? So if uh, a patient comes, they, they're at the registration desk to get their vaccine that day, kind of what's the time frame? You know, what are they going to experience over their, their walkthrough of the program? Sure. So we ask everybody to expect about a half hour um, from the time you get there to the time you're done. So first off, you go to the registration desk. They're going to um, have you fill out the consent at that point. Then you're going to go into the vaccine room, which you're going to um, be greeted by a couple of nurses. They're going to give you a vaccination card. That's just something to help you keep track of your vaccine and when you got it. Um, you'll have education there. Any questions that you may have will be answered. Um, you'll get a copy of the emergency use authorization or the U EUA. Um, then you're going to move into um, the next spot is you'll be vaccinated there. Um, so after that, then you're going to move into a monitoring room, which we do monitor everybody for at least 15 minutes. If at any point you had any reaction to any type of immunization or injection, we do ask that you wait for 30 minutes um, just to ensure that you don't have a reaction at that time. And then once you are done with either your 15 minute or 30 minute monitoring station period, then um, you're free to go. And we also get you scheduled for your second vaccine. Now you mentioned that vaccination card. If people are looking at social media, that's what they've seen people holding up frequently if they're not doing a live photo of them getting the shot. This is like 16 year olds with driver's license, getting this card that shows that you've gotten eventually two shots on it this might be the way of getting onto a flight later this year, you know, getting into certain events by showing that you completed the vaccination program. So that vaccination card is actually a very important thing to keep and make sure you bring to your next appointment too, right? Absolutely. Uh, on the uh, adverse effect profile, Nicole, would you mind going through just a, kind of a, a, um, 
as far as severe reactions, what, what have we seen um, numbers wise in Carroll County? Sure. I think currently we've had um, three reactions, three severe reactions um, from the vaccine, but again, no hospitalizations. You know, um, typically what we've seen is some sore arms, fever, chills, kind of some just mild symptoms. Um, you know, it seems that it's about 12 to 20 hours after the vaccine that you're going to kind of experience those um, symptoms, but most are doing better in 24 to 48 hours for sure. And we know we've done 900 of the Moderna in the county, uh, actually 900 plus because of some of those extra doses that we were able to pull out of a vial. And then an, uh, another uh, at least 100 Pfizer doses in the nursing homes. Uh, so uh, the, the national average for severe adverse reactions is less than 1%. So what we're seeing locally is similar to what has been published nationally of a severe adverse reaction from the vaccination rate of less than 1%. Does that sound right? Yep, correct. Uh, Dr. Collison, you were one of the first people in the county to get it. Uh, what would you say about your reaction, if, if any, and experience with shot number one? I had just a minor amount of soreness for a day or so, and that's it. Um, basically, nothing to speak of. And a lot of us will be getting shot number two this coming week. I know, I think I'm up for tomorrow morning for shot number two, and I, I'm, I'm thrilled, I'm excited, because two weeks after shot number two, Dr. Collison, is that kind of the, when we expect the, the efficacy to be there? Yes, well, what happens is when you get the vaccine, that mRNA has to go into the cells. The cells have to make this protein that's um, the spike protein of the virus. Then the other cells have to recognize that as being foreign, and then they have to make antibodies against it. So it's a, you know, it takes a little while to do that. And the second dose, the body's immune system is already primed. So that second vaccination, um, the immunity um, really goes up. And I think maybe the side effect profile might be slightly more after the second vaccine for that reason. And Dr. Evans, what do we see with the, the second dose as far as adverse reactions? Uh, well, what I've read, because we ha don't have much experience yet here, is um, similar but slightly more severe, as Dr. Collison said. So maybe... Um, uh, more of a sore arm and um, unofficially I found men complaining of more sore arms than women but that stands to reason um, and uh, and then you know some people get the fevers and chills and the body aches which are predictable and I would expect those would probably be a little more severe with the second one. Mm -hmm. Again because the immune system is uh, already primed and will right. rev up much more aggressively from number two. Right and that means your your immune system is working and, and this is the side effect of your immune system going to battle for you. It's, it's making you feel achy and tired and sore, and that means it's working. That, that's your body producing millions of, of antibodies so that if you are exposed to the coronavirus, your body's ready for it. Exactly. Uh, Nicole, can you uh, uh, kind of go over um, what we expect for February 1st as far as what does moving into 1B mean? Sure. So, um like you said, moving it into February 1st, we're hoping to get more vaccine. Um, that that looks like um, 75 and older, the 75 and older group right now. Um, and then as well as like um, meat packing plants, places that are in close settings um, and still essential, the essential workers. Um, so right now they're saying 50% of our allocation will go to 75 and older and 50% will go to the other businesses. Um, so we've been in contact with businesses here in the county and we're kind of asking them to tear out their employees, you know, um, say for schools, we want the most patient facing, you know, the highest risk population. Or student facing. Student facing, yeah, sorry. <laughs> um, you know, and just kind of asking them to tear out their employees so we can get the higher risk ones done first. Because like I've said before, we still know that vaccine is probably going to be limited in small amounts that we receive. So to get a, to, to put detail on it, uh, the minimum that the state told us to expect is 100 doses per shipment. 
or, or right. 100 shots uh, to, to put it into perspective for folks. So uh, let's say we are told to move into phase 1B for February 1st and we get 100 doses for February 1st. We're gonna try to get one line going for the 75 and older group with the 50 doses and another line going for the non-healthcare essential workers because we should have gotten the vast majority of the healthcare essential workers done under phase 1A. Right. Yep. And we're going to try to prioritize the, the schools, law enforcement, the, the, the categories that Iowa Department of Public Health has given us to really try to get phase 1B going. Right. Yeah. One, a lot of, we had a lot of questions revolving around schools. And uh, Sarah, would you mind? So a lot of the school districts in Carroll County, well, not a lot, but many of them straddle more than one county. And a lot of the doses are allocated by county. So uh, let's pick... Uh, Arweva, that has uh, building, in other words, they straddle both Crawford and Carroll counties. Well, what would be the plan for the uh, staff and teachers of Arweva School District as it relates to county public health with phase 1B? Sure, so what we're going to ask is if you have a school building in another county besides Carroll County, we're gonna ask that you contact your lo that local public health to help get those folks vaccinated. If by some reason there's not enough vaccine or there's troubles that are ran into, um, you can always get back to us here at Carroll County and we'd be more than happy to see what kind of vaccine we would have left over um, to get the rest of that um, school district vaccinated. So if they're planning on getting the vaccine as a 76 year old, it'll go by their county of residence, correct? Correct. But if they're going for to get it through their employer, like uh, they work for the Carroll Police Department, we would look for, regardless of where they live, if they're gonna do it through the Carroll Police Department, that's the reason for them being vaccinated, we'll do that out of Carroll. Absolutely correct, yes. So it, it kind of depends on why they're being called for you know, what, the, what their group is. If their group is based on age, it'll be their county of residence. If it's based on employment, we'll do it based on the, the county where they're employed. Right. Uh, uh, also on the school districts, uh, will we, you talked about tiering out, but uh, we're not really looking to, to limit it to only certain people of the, the school district. We're, we're asking the people with the most exposure, the school district to give us those names first, but we would like to work our way through the entire school district, through their coaches, through their bus drivers, et mm -hmm. cetera. Is that accurate? Yep. Administration through everybody. Yes, it's just like what we had to do with healthcare workers. We had to start tiering and prioritizing them just because there's not enough vaccine to go around for everyone yet. And to put those numbers, let's say we're only getting 100 doses. We can get through those in a half day. Or sooner, correct, yes. Uh, the, the You guys have done a very efficient job with the healthcare workers over these last three weeks. So if, we, if all we get is 100 doses, those can get utilized very, very quickly. Correct. Probably next day after we get shipment, um, we'll get the clinic going. Uh, Nicole, on the, the logistics of it. So uh, right now, the healthcare workers, we've uh, predominantly been doing this at uh, St. Anthony Hospital. Uh, McFarland Clinic got an allotment for their healthcare workers. Manny Regional Healthcare Center got an allotment for their healthcare workers. But a lot of the uh, independent ones, the dentists, things like that, we've done it through the hospital. What do you foresee uh, if we still are only getting about 100 doses a week, what, what do you see as being the initial rollout for February as far as kind of what, uh, choosing a central location initially, et cetera? Yeah, no, I think right now, um, as long as we only get the 100 doses, we plan to keep, to continue to do it up there at the hospital, just for the room and it's just worked so nice. Um, you know, we're hoping eventually we'll get more, you know, maybe two to three to 400 doses at a time. And then we would move to a place here um, in the, in Carroll that's centrally located, easy access, you know, has room for mass clinics, um, you know, and we would try to do that centrally. And then, you know, once we get enough vaccines, hopefully we'll be able to allocate them to um, like Mc the clinics, McFarland clinics and Anthony clinic, um, and then we would go to maybe the smaller communities to kind of get the people that maybe can't travel here to Carroll. So let's just say prayers are answered and we get thousands of doses per week. It's very unrealistic for a while, but I mean, truly prayers are answered. The idea is, is 
McFarland Clinic, the St. Anthony Clinics, we've had them all approved as vaccination sites, correct? Correct, yep. So if it's not a matter of inventory, if we, if we have a bunch of doses, the idea is, is that people will have, I mean, we, we'll, they could get vaccinated at their clinics eventually. That's the hope, yes, eventually. But again, I, that's a long way off, unfortunately. I, I can see that, you know, that might be early summer, late summer, maybe when we're able to do that. As soon as we are able. As right? soon as we are able. As soon yeah. as we are able. That we are the, just as anxious as everyone else. The utilization has been amazing. I mean, the, the people have gotten in. The, we, we've been able to not just use up every dose, but every little extra dose that we're able to pull off. It's just a matter of getting doses from either the state or uh, the federal government to Carol to be able to get it into people. Correct. And I, I would mention that um, the pharmacy chain, you know, they have the Pfizer vaccine. Well, that contract is up with the state in early February. And that's why they think we'll have more doses to move on to 1B. So, you know, currently they're allocating, I think they said around 19,000 doses to the long-term care facilities. So once they get through those, we'll have more doses available to send to local public health too. So let's say right now, I live in Sac County. I'm 80 years old, but my primary care clinic is in Carroll. Mm -hmm. If Sac County, you know, after February 1st is able to get, based on my being 75 or older, if I can get my vaccine through Sac County Public Health, I should try to enroll through there if, if they're able to. Absolutely. Yep. And if, if we have enough doses where we're able to call through the clinics, we will do so. But again, that would have to be prayers answered that we're getting a lot more inventory of vaccines than we've been getting so far. Yes. Yep. And, you know, the allocation that we get is kind of based on our population. So, you know, it kind of goes by how many we have in our county is how many that we're going to get. Um, so, yeah, we encourage people to get them in their county of residence. Um, but certainly if they doctor here or here, we'll certainly help out. Wonderful. Dr. Evans, uh, a very specific question that uh, came up. If somebody's gotten vaccinated, can they still donate plasma? Specifically convalescent plasma for COVID-19. So can I go back to that other issue just real quick? Oh, absolutely, absolutely. So with, the, with the clinics, um, just, just to clarify, if, if we get the vaccine at the clinics, we will vaccinate all our patients and so will the other clinics regardless of county. So exactly. If, exactly. Uh, we don't want anybody to be left out. The same thing with St. Anthony clinics and the other clinics that are um, that just distributing the uh, vaccine. So if you've had the vaccine, can you still donate plasma? Yes. Is that, is that the question? Can you donate specifically convalescent plasma related to COVID-19? Um, so I would not see any problem with that uh, because you're uh, antibodies are formed and your plasma would contain them and those could be passed on. And, and medically, that, that's true of the literature, but I think we all have experience where sometimes the blood banks have their own rules. You know, uh, they, they'll, certain blood thinners, they won't accept patients on, et cetera. Right. So if a blood bank says no, that's their prerogative. But medically, there's nothing to suggest it. Correct. Whether they're, uh, whether they're formed naturally or they're induced by the vaccine, uh, there's still antibodies and they should work against COVID-19. And uh, I don't know if you're gonna talk about the new strain, but uh, there seems to be good evidence that even though the new strain is more infective, it seems to be being covered by these two vaccines and uh, at the same rate, which is a good sign. So when we say infective, meaning it can be passed from person to person even easier than the prior strains of COVID-19, right? Correct. Yeah, um, pe people don't seem to be getting sicker. They, more people are getting sick. They're not. They're at the same level of sickness as uh, the original or the first version that we know it as. Um, but the vaccine seems to be protecting against both, which is a good sign. Uh, Dr. Collison, uh, the phrase herd immunity has come up both uh, back uh, 10 months ago and especially now related to the vaccine. Can you kind of uh, it, it was a, it, I'll, I'll give credit to the author. It was a funny question because it was, uh, so back then herd immunity was a bad thing, but now it's a good thing. What's, what's going on? So if, if you could kind of explain uh, how vaccines relate to herd immunity. So the way that works is 
what um, room the virus has to spread. And if everyone is susceptible, if no one has immunity, then the virus can travel from person to person quite easily. But as more and more people um, develop the illness or become vaccinated, then it's harder and harder for the virus to find the next victim, if you will. So, um, and the exact rate, um, how many people need to be protected before that happens, there's different numbers based on how infectious the organism is, but somewhere 70, 80% of the population. So when 70 or 80% of the population has been immunized or has had the disease, then it should be much, much less readily spread. And uh, why was that a bad thing a year? Like why, why, were, uh, why was the medical community advocating against herd immunity when it was brought up six months ago? Well, because very simply, um, the only way to get it before the vaccine is to get sick. And a certain number of people, as we know, um, get very sick and some of them die. And so to uh, acquire that herd immunity, there are a lot of people that end up getting very sick. Whereas if you do it with the vaccine, now we're talking a whole different thing. The, the same benefit with much less risk. Absolutely. If I could add to that, we get a lot of people asking, um, should I get the vaccine? I've already gotten COVID and or I'm a young, healthy person. I don't need the vaccine. But if we are going to achieve that herd immunity, Dr. Callison was talking about that 70 to 80%, whatever that number is, we need as many people as possible to get vaccinated so that this forest fire runs out of room to burn so that there's less people out there that are susceptible and it'll go away. If we don't get enough people vaccinated with long-term immunity from the vaccine, we won't have enough herd immunity to make this thing go away, make this forest fire burn out. Absolutely. And while there is definite uh, natural immunity from getting the disease, it's still conflicting data on how long and not everybody gets the same amount of immunity from the disease. It's somewhat dependent on how severe of a course they had. Uh, whereas with the vaccination, it's a much clearer cut efficacy as far as long-term immunity. Is that accurate? Um, I don't think that is. I think you can say short-term, um, we have the data. We don't have the data for long-term. We don't really know how long um, we can protect people using the vaccines we have. That, that'll come this coming summer, right? When uh, the the antibody titers from the people who volunteered initially in the summer of 2020 will recheck to see how much immunity those people still have one year later. Yeah. Uh, Sarah, uh, great question. Uh, let's say I've gotten vaccinated and I've gotten my second shot and it's two weeks after my second shot. So I should be part of that 95% uh, immune group. Can I stop wearing a mask? Unfortunately, not quite yet. Um, close to being out of the woods, but not 100%. We have to remember that the vaccine is not 100% reliable to keep us from getting COVID, although 95% is great. Um, you know, I mean, you just need to make sure that we have the governor, the Carroll County Board of Supervisors, the schools, a lot of businesses. We're still in that mask mandate until a majority of these um, folks, our people here in our county, get the vaccine. And that's um, going to help bring down what Dr. Collison and Dr. Evans were talking about, that herd immunity, build that up um, so everybody's risk decreases. And as we look at that, um, Iowa Department of Public Health, they have a lot of epidemiologists who start looking at all this data. And they will be the ones, they'll let us know, um, you know what, uh, we have enough data, we have enough people who've been vaccinated. We believe it's going to be um, safe at this point to take off our masks. Um, that was the same data we saw when Iowa Department of Public Health said that you do not have to quarantine if you and the person who exposed you to COVID had masks on. There was enough data showing that the transmission is much less. Um, so we'll be looking forward to that data probably this summer, um, fall time to see where they're at. Uh, and I'll just say on a personal note, I, I'm getting my second shot tomorrow, but I don't expect anybody on the sidewalk to know that, you know, I've gotten my two vaccinations. So also just to be a good role model, I'm until, even though I think I'm 95% protected, 
not everybody else who encounters me on the street knows that. So I'm still going to try to be a good role model until all of us are in the same boat. And until, as you said, Sarah, a majority of us have gotten access and gotten vaccinated. Right. All right. We're in our last 15 minutes. So we're going to shift to a little bit more of a lightning round. Dr. Evans, a great question, especially given our uh, population. Should practicing Catholics have any moral obligation, uh, moral objection to getting either of the two currently approved COVID-19 vaccines? So I would answer that with um, the fact I think each individual person needs to decide for themselves what's right for them. Um, but given the uh, fact that these vaccines have been very well published on how they've done their studies, the, the Vatican, the US Conference of Bishops and our four bishops in Iowa have all looked into this and they feel as uh, Catholics that it is morally responsible to get the vaccine and they're encouraging us all to get the vaccine. Um, if you want to get down into the more details about it, I encourage you to visit with your priest or pastor, um, or I'd be happy to visit with someone, uh, but it, very encouraging that our, our church leaders are comfortable with it and they're recommending that we get it. So as practicing Catholics, I, I believe it's morally responsible and a, a good thing to do. Thank you. Uh, uh, Nicole, can we still transmit COVID-19 after vaccination? Again, I, you know, the studies are still out there, but that's why they're still encouraging the mask and um, the mitigation efforts because we just don't know for sure. You know, we're really hoping that with the 95% efficacy of the vaccine that the transmission rate is going to be way, way lower, um, but you just don't know 100%. So that's that's why we, we're still going to have masks and mitigation efforts in place for a while yet. 5% is not the same as 0%, right? Correct. Uh, Dr. Evans, um, have you seen or heard of any patients, even a few months post COVID infection, still having either a bad smell or lack of smell uh, going forward? Absolutely, that seems to be one of the most unpredictable and longest lasting side effects. So, um, but for, for public health uh, screening and for returning to work, it's not considered a, a deal breaker. So if you've lost your smell or your taste, and you're otherwise feeling well, you've met your quarantine days, you can go back to work and, and, and so forth. So those symptoms can last for weeks or even months. Um, uh, I don't think there's any data to suggest it's permanent, but it does seem to be very, very sensitive to this uh, virus, especially in younger people. And um, have hope that it'll get better. Um, and uh, save on uh, cheaper food in the meantime, I guess, if uh, it doesn't taste good. <laughs> uh, isn't that the same thing happens with smoking? You, you lose some of your sense, food doesn't taste as good, et cetera, right? Right. Uh, Nic uh, Nicole, are we having any issue with expiration dates for our vaccines where we're not able to utilize them before they expire? No, absolutely not. We've done a great job. Um, you know, with the 1A, we have a big population, so we've been able to use up those vaccines. So the Moderna, it's um, we have six hours to use the vial, um, the 10 doses, um, after we puncture the vial. So we've been planning our clinics with groups of 10, hoping that everyone shows up, and that's why we're really encouraging people um, if you're not able to make your appointment, please call and let us know so we can get someone else in there so we don't waste any vial, any doses. How many doses have we had to waste because we couldn't find somebody thus far? Zero. Excellent work. I mean, that's because I've seen reports in the news of uh, other states and regions that have done that. We're, we're, we're not going to do that in Carroll County, right? No. No. Nope. Right. We, we have lots of people that are willing and able to get it. So um, we're, we're going to find arms for those doses instead of wasting them. Uh, Dr. Collison, uh, another specific, uh, uh, let's say after this initial 75 and up group, we start opening up to younger patients who have chronic health conditions, things like that. Would you say any immunosuppressive disease would kind of count? So um, uh, patients who are on, transplant patients who are on immunosuppressants, uh, diabetics, would those all people you'd say would be of the higher risk category if we've you know, once we eventually get to that group. Right, and uh, people um, on chemotherapy, 
Um, COPD, I think, is a big one because those people are at higher risk also. Um, asthmatics, you know, it's a big group. Um, this is more, I mean, for my day practice, but they said, uh, does having a pacemaker put me at a higher risk? And to the best of my knowledge, no. Mm -hmm. Having a pacemaker does not place somebody at a higher risk of COVID disease. Anybody with better knowledge of that? Not heard that, but renal disease and obesity are two big ones also. Absolutely. Thank you. Um, an eighth grader wants to know if we have an estimate of when we'll have it available for that age group. So uh, 14 years old, uh, I, I'll say I, I'd be surprised if it happens in 2021, but what are your thoughts? I hope it does. I, I think it's gonna be more like summer. Um, but, uh, you know, it, it really depends on the vaccine supply and distribution. Um, that, that's where the, the rub is. But they will probably be one of the last groups to get immunized. So they should can be happy with that because they're the healthiest group. So Exactly. Sarah, great question. So we've talked about uh, February 1st as a possible uh, phase 1B start starting time based on the state. If I'm an 80-year-old Carroll resident, how do I get that vaccine? Do, do I contact Carroll County Public Health? What should I do if I'm an eligible person for phase 1B on February 1st? Sure, so currently um, what you can do is either A, contact us, just keep calling, see what kind of vaccine availability we have. We're also going to be putting it out on our Carroll County Facebook page. We're gonna put it out on the radio um, so more people get it. We're also going to put information out on the, um, the CAT6 channel, which is a- um, The local access? The local access channel, correct. And then I am working with Sarah Anderson with the emergency medical coordinator as who she is, um, to see if we can get it across some kind of, um, through the phones and just calling people. Um, you can always contact your local provider too. Exactly, to that's- Yep, and that was the other thing is we'll also make sure that we work with the local clinics and providers Absolutely. as far as get, getting those initial patients in. Mm -hmm. uh, the uh, question, uh, so a lot of these lightning rounds have come while we've been talking tonight. Um, I've got a family member who's 88 years old but lives independently. Would I get him the vaccine faster by putting him into a nursing home at this point? <laughs> So uh, truthfully, with fe February 1st possibly being just two weeks away, I don't, I, I think that uh, if, if the, if the uh, family member is healthy enough to live independently, let that person live independently and get it, get on that vaccine February 1st. I would say your risk of going in the nursing home would be greater than waiting. All right. and, and back to the, the vaccines and the clinics, um, we, uh, and at McFarland, and I think the other clinics have set up websites uh, on our webpage, McFarlandClinic.com. If you go to COVID, there's updates on there, and you can also get messaging on your phone when your group comes up and so forth. So I think the websites and the social media is going to be a big way to get the message out. Excellent. A great question just came through. Uh, let's say we uh, a patient's gotten the first shot, but something happened and their second shot was delayed. Does that negate the first shot? Is there... In other words, we talked about a three-week and a four-week window, but that really means it just can't happen before then. There is no uh, dire need if they're a, a week late or so, and we just don't want to lose them, right? Correct. Correct. Yeah, we just encourage as close as to 28, 21, 28 days as you can, but certainly you can go over. And they do, I know for the Moderna, we have a four-day grace period, so you could get it four days sooner than your 28 days too, but we do encourage 28 days and after. And right now, when there's such limited limited inventory, um, you know, getting that second dose for the same number of people who got the first dose, that's why it's it's really hard. We we really want to encourage people to to show up on their dates, because just because we uh, um, with with so few doses, we do, we don't want to be scrambling any more than we have to, right? Correct. Yeah, and definitely, if you're not able to make your appointment or need to reschedule, just let us know so we can move those around and you know maybe not puncture a vial and have to try and scramble to find someone to use those. Because like which thus, far you guys, did, which thus far you guys have done and found somebody for every dose, right? We have, we have, yes. Uh, a, a great realistic question. Assuming I've gotten both vaccines, at what point could I more safely visit my family members and not be afraid that I'm a source of giving them COVID? Pretty realistic question. 
in two weeks. But, you know, again, we are all supposed to continue the social distancing and mask wearing. So, you know, you can't just say, well, you know, I can travel all over now and spend all this time on an airplane. Um, you know, we're going to still have to uh, wait on those things until we um, immunize a lot more people, I think. Uh, would it be fair to say that the vaccine is the single strongest mitigation measure we have, but it still doesn't eliminate the risk of transmitting it. It just significantly reduces it. Is that fair? Yep. No. So the more people you congregate with, even after getting a vaccine, there, that still does increase the risk uh, more than more than otherwise. Is that fair? Yeah. Another way to look at it is that 5% of the population is still vulnerable. And if the elderly are exposed to that, that's where the biggest risk is. Uh, a question just came through. Uh, I had a family member that had a very severe case of COVID-19, including blood clots as a sequelae, which I think we've, we've all unfortunately seen quite often that uh, there, there, is, there does seem to be a, a, a thrombophilia or the ability to form blood clots when people have severe COVID-19. Uh, where should patients go to get information on post-COVID issues? First person I'd say would be their primary care provider's office, but I, I'll open it up to you guys. Um, CDC, I think, has some pretty good information for uh, the general public. And so does um, Iowa Department of Public Health, but I can't say I've really looked at that much. They both do, and the uh, University of Iowa has a very nice frequently asked question page as well with lots and lots of information. I would say those three sites, CDC, IDPH, and uh, University of Iowa. Well, that actually, I think we got, uh, uh, we got through all of the, ones, the, the questions that came in during the event. Um, we got just another minute or two to wrap up. Uh, I really wanted to thank the four of you guys and gals again. Uh, Sarah and Nicole have been doing an absolutely incredible job for nearly a year now, uh, organizing, uh, being efficient, working with so many different stakeholders. So uh, you guys deserve a ton of credit because it, it certainly has not been fun a lot of the time, um, but you guys have been doing a fantastic job. So thank you very much. Uh, Dr. Collis and Dr. Evans, uh, you guys have been great. Uh, it's, uh, last time we did this, you guys were uh, two of the four docs that had taken care of the majority of the inpatients. It's nice to be able to kind of move on and talk about the future and things to get us out of this. Um, this recording uh, or a recording of our talk tonight um, will be available on the St. Anthony webpage. So the, the YouTube broadcast of this um, we'll also uh, be able to share it with Carroll County Public Health. We'll share it on the various social media pages. Uh, an important number, so the Carroll County Public Health phone number is 712-794-5279. Uh, that'll be a number to be able to, uh, when we very loudly and clearly announce that we're moving into phase 1B for sure, um, that'll be a number to call uh, to get set up. Uh, but I wanna, uh, at the end of our last uh, town hall meeting, I thanked uh, the public and really asked them to be partners in mitigating uh, the efforts because when we did this talk, the numbers were quite high, the inpatients were quite high. The public really responded. You guys did a tremendous job of being partners with us to bring down the numbers. And while it's great to, to be talking about getting out of this, I just uh, would, uh, uh, a polite request for the public to keep being really good partners of us and, uh, to help keep our numbers down and help keep us get over this because uh, um, we're in a lot better place. But I'll, I'll leave the last uh, uh, words for the, the panel members. I guess I would just like to encourage everybody, when your turn comes up, get the vaccine. It is much safer than getting COVID. And, you know, we do see some really serious problems. So um, get the vaccine. It's safe, um, as Dr. Evans said just do it. Thank you, Dr. Collison. Any other last closing comments? I would just like to say thank you too to the public for all the mitigation efforts and just have some patience. We're all just as excited for the vaccine too and we're hoping to get it out as soon as we can. So we're working really hard and we're thankful to have that and yeah, move on to newer things. Thanks, Nicole. I would echo that and uh, 
if you do have questions, you know, you can read the, the websites and so forth, but if you still have questions, be sure to get them answered. It's your right to know. And um, this is all new and it keeps changing quickly. So don't be afraid to ask, but I echo what everyone else has said that the vaccine is our way to get this terrible virus to go away. It's our way to reopen the economy and stop the suffering and the economic and the mental health distress. There's gonna be a lot of things uncovered over the next year uh, in the aftermath of this that aren't currently obvious now that were a result of this uh, devastating virus. So the sooner we get it behind us, the, the better we can do, to get back to lives as we once knew them and get our health returned. And Yep, and I just want to echo everybody also and reiterate, um, we would love for everybody to get the vaccine, but please make an informed decision. Um, go to the right websites, uh, the CDC, IDPH, they're very reliable. That's where you're going to find great information. Give us a call. We can help you. Please call your local doctor. Um, they're there to help too. So uh, again, I want to thank everybody for working so hard. We're mitigating great. Um, just keep it up and there is a light at the end of the tunnel. All right, with that, we'll close. Thanks again for everybody who viewed this, for sending questions uh, to our panelists. Thank you uh, to everybody. Have a great night, stay safe, uh, and thanks again.